Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Mary Grace Anderson, and I work with Shell. I'm the Vice President of Safety, Environmental, and, Safe and uh, Social Performance uh, for the upstream businesses in Shell in the Americas. And I'm really pleased to be here this afternoon uh, for this panel, which is a deep dive on uh, carbon sequestration, can it save the planet? Um, as an energy business um, participant and a, a leader in the in energy business, we really recognize the challenges that we face uh, in producing higher and higher levels of energy because of the demands that we see for greater energy and also meeting the demands of the consumers as well as our investors. And part of that is also understanding the CO2 emissions element of that and managing the CO2 emissions. Climate change is real and we really need to do something about that. It's a risk that we are managing as a regular part of our business in the energy businesses because it is something that we recognize could impact us for the long haul. And we're committed to actually um, doing things that mitigate CO2 today. So we're trying to, we are implementing a variety of things that actually mitigate CO2. And we're also looking at ways to test future technologies for mitigating CO2 as well. I've had the benefit in the past several years of actually getting to see carbon capture and sequestration, which I'll call CCS sometimes, so don't get caught up in the acronyms. Um, I've had an opportunity to see it kind of up close and personal, both from a technical perspective and an economic perspective. And so what I can say is it's a very important technology that we do need to understand better. There are challenges and obstacles associated with it, but it's really worthwhile to have this sort of debate to find out how we do carry forward with uh, carbon capture and sequestration. Our climate experts believe that carbon capture and sequestration is one of the elements and is a must-do element for us to actually manage our carbon emissions to within those limits that are acceptable. And so it is one of the things that we really must implement to be effective. So Shell is also investing heavily in this. We've actually invested billions of dollars in demonstration projects, which we have in Australia, we have them in the UK, and we have them in Canada. And we're doing that because we think the best way to really understand the challenges of these technologies is to actually demonstrate that we can do it. So I just want to give you one kind of tangible example of what we're doing, and that's the Quest Carbon Capture and Sequestration Project that we're partnering with the government of the provincial government of Alberta and the federal government in Canada to pull together a project where we will reduce our emissions from our oil sands operations by a million tons per year. That amount would be the equivalent of taking 175,000 cars off the road, so it's significant. And that project will start injecting CO2 in 2015. So this is something we put our money behind our mouths on. Because of the opportunities and challenges attached to that, I'm really pleased to actually be able to introduce this panel today because I am very interested in hearing what uh, Charles and James have to say. So, James, I'll hand it over to you. James is a national correspondent for The Atlantic. Uh, he is also an NPR um, correspondent and does commentary for NPR. Uh, He's reported extensively outside the U.S. He also was a chief speech writer for President Carter. Uh, he's done something that I really envy, which is writing 10 books. I wish I could write one book. Uh, his latest one is The China Airborne, The Test of China's Future, and he's won the National Magazine Award, and he's also won the American Book Award. So with that, James, I'd like to hand it over to you. Great. Th thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Grace. Thank thanks to Shell. Thanks to you all for coming here. I'm really looking forward to this session, mainly because I'm looking forward to the chance to ask my friend and colleague, Charles Mann, some questions I've, that, 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 that I think he knows uh, better than, than most of us do, and just to hear a very um, creative and original and informed scientific mind look, talk about these questions that, that concern us a lot. I'm going to ex uh, explain a little bit about my own background on this story and then the unusual background of the two of us being together on the stage for this particular topic. 
So I've written, I worked for The Atlantic for a very long time. I had joined the magazine in 1979 after I fled the Carter administration from the, the speechwriter role. Jimmy Carter was a, was and is a great man, but a poor speaker, as some of you may recall. So it was a really morale building or, or character testing <laughs> uh, calling to, to be a speechwriter. Uh, and in my time with The Atlantic, I've lived around the world with my family and then reported on things, most recently in China. My wife and I moved to China um, eight years ago, we left the Aspen Ideas Festival in 2006 with all of our bags full of stuff we thought we'd need in China for the ensuing years, and we came back from China in 2009 to the Aspen Ideas Festival, so I associate Aspen and, and China together. When I was living in China, a subject that became more and more the focus of my own writing was the environment, which I argue is the major challenge to China's continued political stability, its economic growth, its effect of the world, and everything else. And near the end of my time there, I began doing a piece, a research for a piece that actually ran as an Atlantic cover story in 2010, essentially arguing that, that while everything about coal was repugnant to the modern, refined imagination, especially in the United States, there simply was no alternative to the world in general continuing to use coal, China in particular using more and more coal, and therefore to finding better ways to use coal as the only alternative to, as the only hope for, for dealing with, with, with climate and, and emissions um, issues. And so, so that was a, 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 the case I made in the magazine a, a while ago. Charles, over the last couple of years, has been doing a, a project that came out as a Wired story a few months ago. It was in, Mar I think, the March issue of, of, of Wired, uh, coming to a, 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 similar, a, a different but similar conclusion, essentially that coal was going to be with us no matter what and that therefore it was imperative to find some way to use it, and sequestration was, was an important part of that. After my article came out, I got pushback from a lot of people who said this is just, just the wrong thing to be writing, it's wrong on the politics, it's wrong on the technology, it's wrong on the economics, and et cetera. So I mention that because we had the situation where Charles and I are seen as being occupying the same side of a very contentious debate. We both have independently come to the conclusion that you have to deal with coal and that China and the U.S. need to work together on it. But so as to have the Aspen spirit of full and frank exchange of ideas, I'm actually going to take the opposite side of the debate for the next while and asking Charles to defend his case. I mean, I'm sort of hinting to all of you that these are questions that have been asked to me over the years, and so I'm, I will ask them to Charles. And before the end of our time here, we'll have a chance for all of you to ask any questions that, that I have not. So let me start with the, the basic uh, premise, um, which is that, that in the United States, there's been substantial progress towards use of renewables. Most of the new installation has been renewables for companies like Shell, for entire nations like Germany. If you fly around the country, as Deb and I have been doing, you see wind turbines every place, you see solar farms every place. Is it not just then defeatist to say, yes, let's find ways to deal with coal? Well, I guess I should first say, how many of you have been to China? Okay, so you know what I'm talking about. They use a lot of coal. <laughs> How many, when, the first, and if you've been there for any time, the first time I went to China was in 1984. The difference in the economic status of the country between 84 and 2014 is really extraordinary. You know, several hundred million people have been lifted out of destitution into something resembling the middle class. It's the biggest, fastest increase in human well-being in history. There's been nothing like it. It's a really tremendous and remarkable. And this happened because of industrialization, and it happened because China has an ocean of cheap coal that they use to power this. Coal is not only used for heating and for electricity, but the actual coal itself, turned into a form called coke, is used as part of the process of making steel. And if you've been to China, you know they make a lot of steel. Currently, they make about half the world's production. Cheap coal is also the basis for cement. If you've been to China recently, you know that the um, Chinese miracle is based on cement and steel. So this enormous amount of coal power has been absolutely fundamental to China's economic growth. But if you've also been to China, you know that they have somewhere between 350 and 400 million people there who still live on less than $2 a day. People who are really broke. The Chinese government very naturally wants to do something about this. They want to build, have, have decent heat, they want them to have decent electricity, they want them to have roads, they want them to have schools. All this means power, it means steel, it means cement. They have two choices for this. One is that they can import it, you know, in the form of oil or natural gas, because China has relatively little of both. 
or they can use the local, steel, the local coal, which is right there. The Chinese are gonna, do, are gonna choose that. They don't have the money to do anything else. And they're, so they're building coal plants at this phenomenal rate. You know, it's difficult to know exactly how many, because but the World Resources Institute estimates it's one a week for the next 10 years. One coal plant commissioned per week for the next 10 years. Again, this number is kind of squishy, but it's not wrong. Um, so given that, what are we gonna do? And I would argue that, you're gonna, that they're not going to simultaneously put an entire United States, remember 350, 400 million people, worth of infrastructure in place while simultaneously taking the one they just built, ripping it out, and replacing it with, with solar. They, they're building solar and wind faster than anybody else on the planet. They can't possibly do it. The coal is going to be there. And the same thing is um, true in other developing nations. So it has to be dealt with. So that's the premise. And so would you quantify that premise to some degree? Again, people in Europe and the United States, they see all the non-fossil fuel sources being ramping up very quickly. Give us some of the numbers about why, well, despite that, you argue that coal is well, still you know, unavoidable. The solar power, I think, yeah. has increased 400% in the last 10 years or something like that. But if you look at the numbers, 12% of the United States power is from renewable sources. Half of that is from hydroelectric. So you get, now you're down to 6%. A big chunk of the, half of that is from biomass, where you're you know, burning forests and so forth, which a lot of environmentalists don't like for obvious reasons. In fact, it's banned in the state of Massachusetts. We've basically banned in our entire infrastructure, um, which is where I live. Um, so you're now looking at something on the order of one and a half, two percent 2%. So, Look at the incredible increase we've had in the last 10 years. To get up to 20%, we have to go up by an order of magnitude. I mean, that's a, just an enormous enterprise. Um, I think it's that we can possibly do it, but to imagine that we can get to 50 or 80% with, um, and then the big issues of solar and wind come in, which is that they're intermittent. Um, one of the things, I was raised in the Pacific Northwest. They have a huge wind farms on the eastern Washington. And uh, there's a graph that, uh, that was passed around to me showing the wind output in the year um, 2011 from there. And there are two two-week periods in which there was no wind from this entire area. Now, to make the wind power work there, you're going to have to have two weeks of power stored if you're going to do purely from wind. And there is no technology anywhere that even imagines storing two weeks' worth of power for an entire region. So, I, so I, something I, I neglected to mention in introducing Charles is there's probably no popular and skillful writer better equipped than he to talk about these questions of the interaction among technology, environmental forces, and, and human civilization. His books 1491 and 1493 are about the effects of humanity on the North American continent. And your recent essay, What State of the Species in Orion Magazine, mm -hmm. I would recommend that everyone read that about the existential questions of the environment. So, so Charles is someone well informed on the fragility of, of the environment. Tell us now then why we should not just despair when we hear the one, one coal, span, coal plant per week in China. Well, I mean, first, despair is not really a super productive way to look at the world, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of a drag. Um, and uh, so emotionally, I'm, I'm against it. But the other thing is that people have done extraordinary things. Remember, we were just talking about China. If you, when I went to China in 1984, it was horrific. Um, I mean, people were really, really poor. Um, it's like, you know, and you went into the rural areas and, uh, you know, there was no plumbing. There was, uh, it, people were in rags. I mean, it was a very, very poor country. And the change there is enormous. And so this is the kind of thing that people were able to do. And I don't particularly want to look at these people in, in China that I meet who have, by dint of an enormous effort, really pulled themselves up and you know, given the opportunity, have done remarkable things for themselves and say, oh, sorry, we're writing you off. And, and to, to interrupt there and mm -hmm. stipulating that I basically agree with you, but I'm going to, I'm going to uh, assert mm -hmm. that, that I don't, <laughs> the, the, same, the same generation of progress in China has man, meant epidemics of birth defects in China because the pollution is so horrific, poison food scandals every single week the air in most big cities so unhealthy that the, the, the Chinese government says the life expectancy in Beijing is five years shorter than right. it should Right, it's all of northern China, world. yeah. And, and, and even, you know, there's no part of China that's really free of that you go out in the, in the provinces and the air is black there too. And so it's not been an unalloyed uh, benefit. And so 
paying more attention to the environmental consequences of Chinese growth is important too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you, and uh, a great deal of that is because of poor governance. Um, I'll give you. I'll we'll tell that to the CCP. I mean, yeah. They're not going to agree. <laughs> no, but it's true. It's yeah. true, and particularly on the local level. You know, uh, I, a few years ago, I went to a town called Leo Zhou, which is um, in Guangxi in, this, in the southwest, and. Uh, you know, it, with, with some friends, uh, uh, we met these Amway salesmen. And so we said, you know, I couldn't believe it, Amway in China. This is great, right? Yeah. As a journalist. And so we said, can we follow you? And, you know, this pyramid scheme, right? That, that we, we want to see. And so they, they drove us around these, you know, dirt roads, very, very poor, making their pitch to these, to these villagers. And they, one of the villages we stopped in about 15 miles outside of Leo Zhou, these people said, oh, you're Western reporters. Thank God. You're here. We, this is not a reaction that reporters normally get. And uh, so, we, so we said, why are you doing this? He said, we've got to show this to you. And um, the brother-in-law or the son-in-law of a local political figure had established um, a pulp mill um, on, the, um, on the river where they got their water supply from, which is a tributary of the, of the Leo River, which is where Leo Zhou is. And they um, said, look at this. We want to show it to you. And this, tributary of this tributary is coming out in the water. They kept saying the water's black like soy sauce, black like soy sauce. So they took us out in the boat and it was this like a river of soy sauce pouring into this river. And of course it's filling the river with horrible stuff and they'd, they'd sued and they'd uh, done everything that they could poss possibly do. So they're so desperate they're talking to reporters. And, <laughs> and the striking thing about this was that two things happened. First, there are people fishing in this water. And so you know, my, I was with my friend Josh, and we, we said, we've got to go talk to these people and ask them what they're going through their mind. And we came up, and they said, we, we said, what are you doing? And they said, oh, don't worry. Don't worry. They'll never catch us. We sell it 100 miles away. <laughs> <laughs> and then the second thing that happened was that a police boat came and chased us away. Yeah. Chased you away. Chased us yeah. away, yes. but not them. <laughs> and so, you know, this is a thing where governance is, is really an issue. Yes. So... Let's set aside for a moment changing governance in China. I'm talking about the basic uh, mechanism of trying to make coal cleaner. Mm -hmm. If we're, we're asserting, if you're asserting that sequestration is an answer, how does it actually work and what steps have to be taken to make it work enough? Okay. So you burn coal and all this junk goes into the air, right? Including carbon dioxide. And there are various techniques called you know, scrubbers and so forth that we've installed in almost all US, US plants, but we haven't done it for uh, carbon dioxide. And so basically they get a big silo full of a chemical that um, combines with car um, carbon dioxide. Um, it's called, um, let's see, I'm gonna get, the, I wanna get this right. Is it MEA carbon? MEA, which is methyl um, something. Somebody, mono, I bet here somebody knows. Marvin, do you know what it is? Monoethanol, monoethanolamine, meth, ethanolamine, monoethanolamine. So, and it's this horrible toxic stuff. I mean, it's nothing you'd want anywhere near you. And so it combines with this to form MEA carbamate, which is a kind of salt. Then they take this um, stuff, put it in another silo, boil it, the carbon comes out, and then they pressure it and shove it in the ground. And the all of this is the chemistry is actually quite basic and simple. The problem is that these plants produce a huge amount of carbon dioxide, millions of tons a year, and so you have to have an enormous amount of this stuff. So you're doing you know, industrial chemistry on a very large um, scale, and then you're, so you're boiling constantly giant silos full of, full of liquid. And so this means that a substan substantial portion of the power you're generating, you're using to clean it up. These are called parasitic costs. And um, they're sort of a term of opprobrium you know, in the industry. Like you'd hear, you constantly hear things like, ugh, the parasitics are awful. Um, and that's what they mean, is that to do this, you end up paradoxically, to clean up coal, you end up having to burn a whole lot more of it to just produce, get you back in the same place. So this is why the coal industry has um, been extremely reluctant to do it, even as they have touted it and said, look, we can clean this up. Just don't make us actually do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so to, if, to put things in perspective, what if you had the full cleanup cost and parasitic cost um, allocated against coal, what would its price be relative to other sources of energy? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. The answer is nobody really knows. The other thing I should explain is that I'm, I, I don't want to give the idea that this is a, you know, we understand the basic chemistry, but we, there's a whole lot to go between understanding the basic chemistry and installing many, many of these things and having, having them work. We don't really know how much it would cost. There's only 12 large CCS 
projects anywhere in the world operating at the moment, and not a single one of them is what is really needed, which is a giant coal plant that is taking its output, turning it in, you know, uh, you know, separating out the carbon dioxide and shoving it underground. That hasn't happened. Now, there's a couple of projects that are supposed to open in the next year, and that they're going to do that one in uh, Canada. Um, there's a, there's, um, there's, but there's no real test of this. It should work, but what I'm, what I'm doing is extolling a technology that environmental critics will justly say has never been made to work. And, and on that point, something that struck me when I was doing the reporting for my story, mm -hmm. which I spent a lot of time both in China and at Lawrence Livermore, and a point that Julio Friedman of Lawrence mm -hmm. Livermore made was that we're used in the modern world to Moore's Law scale improvements in everything. Anything in the, uh, the, the infotech world you just assume is going to become automatically better and cheaper, whereas everything involving energy has been at slow, sort of uh, just uh, at linear um, increases. And, but you were saying earlier you thought that, that progress in CCS might have the potential to increase more rapidly. So, so the good part of the fact that it's barely started is that there's usually on this kind of thing a curve of diminishing returns. And so we're on the really good part of that curve. So the first steps to improve it will likely be quite good. Um, for instance, the whole technique of having giant silos full of stuff that you have to boil at very high temperatures, causing huge amounts of, requiring huge amounts of energy, that's an obvious target for Im improvement. And it's happy to say that we're in the middle of a huge boom in material science, you know, in, in people understanding how matter, different forms of matter and different types of matter can, can be combined and how they react with each other. So there's every reason to believe that we can do this much, much better. And, and in not in a kind of a crazy speculative way, but in a kind of way that people are beginning to look at and then to invest in. And another non-obvious thing which struck me when I was, was working on this topic is the level, we know that U.S.-Chinese relationships at the top Obama to Xi Jinping level are often fraught. But the levels below that of a university to university, energy company to mm -hmm. energy company, there seems to be a lot of collaboration and with both sides working as if the future of the world depended on their, on their cooperation. Did you observe that too? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's very, very difficult um, for an outsider like Jim. I think Jim and I both tried and failed to, to visit the same plant and I sort of snuck into the, uh, and, and you know, said, We're not, I'm gonna go to the front gate at least. And uh, they're, they're horrified. Anyway, the, um, and so you get the impression you can't see anything, but you know, all these places are built with extensive collaboration from the US and it's enough U.S. technology has been going on in these places in, in China that you start to think to yourself, is this going to be like a VCR where, you know, basic fundamental insights come from the United States and then they're developed and profited by from somebody else. And, and has that been proceeding apace despite the worsening of U.S.-Chinese relations last year? I think so. Year I think so. I mean, the Chinese are very proud. I mean, they don't say, we took your technology. They say, we're happy that we collaborated, but we contributed a lot, too. Yeah. yeah. There's a parallel point which I observed uh, in my recent book, China Airborne. I was talking, one of the things I was discussing was how Chinese airlines went from being some of the most dangerous in the world to some of the safest in the world over about 15 year period. The real answer was the officials from the FAA, the NTSB, United Airlines, and, uh, and Boeing sort of embedded themselves in the Chinese aerospace infrastructure and, and taught them how it was done. But they all understood not to say do it the American way, the United way, the Boeing way. They said these are the international standards. If you do it the international standards, that was the way, and that's yeah. similar to the point you're, you're making. Let me ask you now about another point that is often discussed with the carbon uh, sequestration in the U.S. How about the whole business of putting it underground? Um, how do we know it's not going to blow up or explode or cause earthquakes or whatever? Well, that's actually interesting. Um, the people that you talk to, that I talk to, think that that's if there's an easy part, I mean, no part is easy, but if there is an easy part, that's the easier part. And the reason is that in many, many types of geological, well, first of all, you should know that carbon sequestration, which is the sort of ugly name, I mean, there's a whole forest of acronyms and so forth that I'm trying to spare you, but we can't avoid this one. Um, carbon sequestration is basically perform, is, is the same thing as an oil deposit or a coal deposit. What they are are big stores of underground carbon. So nature can do this. We know that this can exist. Oil deposits have been underground for millions of years without blowing up, right? So you can do this. And the way it works, and in almost all of these oil deposits, natural gas deposits whatsoever, is there's a layer of porous rock, and on top of it is a layer of impermeable rock. And a drill punches through, and the stuff gushes out. So what you do is you find, a, you find that geological formation. Often you can find them in an exhausted oil wells or ga gas wells. You punch through, you pump it in, and you seal it up. And the interesting thing is that carbon dioxide 
after a few decades, mineralizes. What it does is it combines with the rock, it turns into a rock, and so it should be there until you know, the Earth falls into the sun or something like that. So when you're talking about carbon sequestration, what you're really talking about, if you do the geology properly, and there seems to be, we seem to know enough to be able to do that, is a matter of can we hold it in there for a few decades? In other words, can we build a seal that will hold this stuff in there until it mineralizes? And that's very different than, say, nuclear waste, where you're worried about something that has to last for 10,000 years. Here you're talking 50 years. And I'm going to argue that the United States, you know, the most technologically advanced society on the planet, can make a plug that can last for 50 years. So it goes mm -hmm. in as a liquid? What? It goes in as a liquid? It's, yeah, essentially, it's compressed into a liquid and uh, pumps in, fills up the spaces in the rock, and then you put the plug in. And where on earth is this most successfully being done now? Oil field recapture? Exactly. Yeah, oil field recapture. One of the other benefits you got is, you know, oil fields, when I started doing this, I imagined that oil deposits are like un giant underground swimming pools full of liquid, and they're not. Um, what they are is porous rock, and the rock has different amounts of porosity in it, and the stuff is very inhomogeneous because what you're looking at is somebody's, you know, nature has squished an entire jungle under there and let it rot and complicate. So the jungle's not homogeneous. So there's parts of it that are easier to get out than other parts. So when they say an oil field is exhausted, what it usually means is that a third to the half of the oil is in there, it's just hard to get out. And, but what you can do with this um, carbon dioxide is shove it in there, and when it expands, it forces out a lot of this residual oil. And so the biggest, um, plant that's now being done in the United States is in Kemper County, which is in sort of in the middle of, um, Miss, um, of Mississippi. Um, and they are planning, they have a 60 mile pipeline that they're gonna pump this stuff through and it's gonna go into an exhausted oil field, which again, an oil field that actually has still has a lot of oil in it. And they think they can get 2 million barrels a year of oil out of this field that hasn't been used for decades. And a similar one at least being worked on for Texas, right? The Texas yes. Clean Energy Project. So, so let me shift for the moment from the, the technology. Can I, can I yes. say something yes. here just about this? This Kemper County thing, the, the numbers on these are staggering, okay? So this is like the good thing and the bad thing. It, it's sort of all wrapped up together. This thing is going to cost five and a half billion dollars. And it's basically a big coal plant with a gigantic chemical factory, you know, on, on, um, attached to the end of it. And then there's 64 mile um, pipeline. But it will produce power, they believe, when it's on, switched on next year, um, at, uh, or excuse me, yes, was it switched on? Yeah, next year, that is cleaner than natural gas. So it's very expensive, but, they, but it will also produce, in addition to this, this clean power, two million barrels of oil a year. So it's a big bet for, for them, and that's the kind of economics that you're, you're talking about. It's not clear at all that how well it will work. So I'm going to shift to a sort of more mm. purely Aspen-esque part of the conversation now about some of the, the, the big policy and moral implications of what we're discussing, because our session is about both sequestration and also saving the world, <laughs> uh, uh, saving, saving mankind. So we're in a stage where many parts of the world are developing very rapidly, China most of all, but India right behind it, and in many ways in a much dirtier mm -hmm. form than, than China's developing. It has a growing population as China does not. Other countries are, are making their way up. We have increasing evidence about unprecedented levels of carbon dioxide in the, uh, the atmosphere. We have weather data of various sorts that, that, that is alarming. And we have, in the United States in particular, an almost uniquely inchoate or non-intersecting political landscape where a significant part of one political party says, is sort of committed to saying this is not an issue and should not be dealt with. We have some people who in the previous eras might have been civil rights freedom writers or abolitionists when the magazine or the Atlantic magazine was being founded or other crusaders saying there has to be a crusade against fossil fuel itself. We have a government uh, in the United States and elsewhere that's more concerned understandably with maintaining economic growth than anything else. Suppose you, given your standing as a person who's written extensively about the relationship between sustainable societies and, and technology, suppose you were in charge of talking to the people of this country about this great issue and how, how we deal with it. What is a way that we can hold in our minds the fact that there's a big problem and we can't do anything about it and other countries are affecting it too? How do we think about this in a constructive way? But this is a weird case because in a certain sense, the U.S. is becoming more and more of a bystander. Um, in the issues of, of climate change, not only just because of political paralysis, but because the real action in terms of carbon dioxide is happening elsewhere. Um, you know, largely because of um, you know, the advent of natural gas through fracking, 
U.S. emissions have, have declined somewhat. Um, meanwhile, China's have exploded, and they're now, I think, 27% of the world's uh, emissions, and that's only, that figure is only going to go up. And so less and less what we do internally matters to the, to the, to the big well, picture. Right. It matters but that we become more efficient. Right? It matters that we become more, more, more efficient, but the big, the big opportunities, the big important factors are happening elsewhere. And here we have a, we have a role of world leadership. In a sense, as long as we do nothing, it's easy for the Chinese, and you hear this all the time when you're there, you know, you know why should we do anything? You guys aren't, and you're, you're richer than rich, us. Yes. Yeah, you're richer than us. If we do something about our coal problem, which is much less than what is happening in China or India or even Brazil, um, I, every experience that I've had in China suggests that this will have um, an, an impact as long as we don't try to rub it in people's faces. So is, is that your, yeah. Yes, and, and so, so I asked you in a, in a somewhat flip way, and you asked me, a, in, answered in a somewhat flip way too, about whether, how, why should we not despair? And you say, well, I don't like to despair. And that's, I don't like to despair either. I'm, I'm a chipper guy by, by nature. <laughs> um, but really, if, if you were writing not 1491 or 1493, but 2014, from the perspective a century from now, would you be describing this as essentially a unstoppable tragedy? Or how would you describe the collective um, difficulty in, in grappling with uh, climate issues? Well, there's a huge, I mean, if you think about it, um, climate issues are, are really weird. It's like we're, they're not wired properly for us or we're not wired properly for them. Think, take, how many of you have heard about the, the in last month, the paper, two papers came out, one in geophysical research letters, another one in science about the West Antarctic ice sheets and they're, un, they're committed to mm -hmm. melting and so forth. Well, if you read, the, if you, I read the papers, um, and I thought, well, how much time do we have? Because this is bad. They'll raise the, um, you know, Earth's seas, uh, the sea level by about four feet, which is enough to take out places like Miami. Um, I thought, that's, that's pretty bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, would do all kinds of harm to places like New York and, and Washington, D.C. And so I thought, well, how much time are they talking about? And you can't find it in the, in the first paper. And so I go to the science paper, and they're talking about, um, if you read, you know, way down in this fine print, they're talking about a sea level rise by 2100 of less than one millimeter per year. Okay, so that's an inch by 2100. And then the full impacts don't happen, I, I believe, until 26, 2700. But the curious thing about carbon dioxide is that it's sort of, once you put it up there, it doesn't, it's really hard to get it out. So the stuff that we're having will have an impact 500 years from now. But this is America. We don't even save our own retirement. I mean, we're asked to consider essentially the impacts on people hundreds of years from now, which is, you know, people impossibly distant from, from us. And, uh, you know, we don't even really like foreign aid. And these are, this is the foreignest of foreign aid, if it makes, it makes any sense. Yet, at the same time, the idea of, I mean, it's, I, was, I think I was joking to you that, you know, it's really hard to complete the sentence, I'm so glad the Antarctic was wiped out because. I mean, you know, so you have this thing where you have these enormous consequences that are happening at timescales that are very, very difficult for human, human, being, human psychology, human institutions, and so but forth. But there was an implicit answer to the question early on. I mean, mm. so I'm glad the Antarctic was wiped out because the alternative would be 500 million starving people in China, which right. is essentially what you're saying, that we need to, there isn't any way to, um, isn't that what you were saying before? No, it was, it was just, you know, that would be an answer, but the question is, can we therefore mitigate the damage so we get, you know, something of the Antarctic? It isn't necessary that the, that, that the development in China be done as stupidly and as corruptly as it has been. So before opening up to some questions, I'm gonna do a couple of audience polls. How many of you came in here highly skeptical of carbon capture as a, uh, or clean coal in general? How many, how many are, how many have had their skepticism diminished at all in the last few minutes? Um, who has had their skepticism increased? So somebody who's had it increased, um, why have you had it increased? So uh, tell, me, tell me more about that. Um, so, so we have a tendency to do these things in particularly poor areas mm -hmm. because those folks are politically disenfranchised. And, and that's why oh, it's so yeah. opportune that it's in Mississippi. So I was breaking the rules by not waiting for microphones. So, so I, I will um, we'll have a more sort of formal uh, audience poll question. So actually... Um, so you're worried about environmental justice yes. issues. Yes. Okay. And I think those are legit. But if something like this were built in the suburbs of you know, outside of Washington, D.C., would that? That's right. 
Yeah, okay. Because, yeah. And so logistically what we're going to do, I'm going to call on you, a couple of you, to give similar objections, and I will repeat them for broadcast purposes. And Kevin, yes. The reason I'm more skeptical is what I misunderstood you, and please correct me, but I thought when you had sequestration of CO2 from coal, that it would be like 100%, not 50%. Because if it just comes down to 50%, you're no better than natural gas. So the question is whether this actually is, is worth it. If you're only uh, sequestering part of the carbon, and you can get to that a second. Mm -hmm. Who else has had increased skepticism in the past few minutes who would like to have? OK, so, so deal with that question of whether well, is this worth it at the all. The first US project, you know, they're, they're trying for kind of a low bar. In China, um, the uh, plant that I visited is sequestering something like 95% of the coal and their coal, the CO2 from the coal emissions. Um, and so that's the, the, in China, they're, they're, they're trying for things higher. So well, it should get, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, this is probably a time for the formal uh, question period. So the microphone is over here. So if you form a line here by the microphone, we'll take you in, in order. And this is for broadcast and dissemination of knowledge purposes. So the people outside this room get mm -hmm. yes. And form a queue, we'll take you in order. Um, uh, two questions. One of them, uh, the first one is, why isn't China going after nuclear? They have a government system that uh, would actually politically allow it as opposed to ours. I have an answer to that one. Okay. And the answer is they're doing all of every form of energy production as fast as possible you can. If you talked, if you had a Chinese official here, you'd say, you don't like coal plants? Okay, we're going to build more dams. We're doing that annually. You don't like dams? We're going to build more nuclear plants. We're doing that too. You want more solar panels? We're building them. They're doing all this stuff. They have a lot of nuclear plants on their way there too. Just the demand is increasing so rapidly. Why aren't they building one a week? The, the, there, the technology is there. Uh, I guess it is uh, harder and slower to, so I, I don't know why they're not opening them at a one a week rate, but they're, op they're building them as fast as they think they can. Their, their answer would be that that's all the system will hold. The other question is, in your research of carbon sequestration, is there any carbon capture of actually pulling it back out of the atmosphere. I've read some experiments of it, but I don't know, I, have, I can't find well, much the, about it. The problem it. with that is that you have an, the carbon dioxide is in an envelope that surrounds the entire Earth in a very diffused form. And so you would, you know, all known methods would involve some kind of physical contact between something and that car carbon dioxide. You know, you can't use magic, right, um, to summon it. And so you would have to have something extremely large sweeping through the atmosphere to pick it up. And I don't know if anybody has any idea how to do that. There are some pilot programs. Right, but to do it on a large scale. You know, the right. best way of doing that now is planting forests. And that's a, that's a wonderful way of doing it. Yeah. Yes. yes. And please feel free to queue up here if you have either increased um, skepticism or anything else. more general sort of question based on your, your work on uh, 1491, 1493. So um, this was an era of somewhat uh, dynamic in a lot of ways, um, uh, economically in terms of population growth and so on and so forth. And some have attributed that to uh, the medieval climate optimum, the time, it was at the tail end of that. Um, and so um, later on, um, it, it became a little bit colder and things got a little bit more difficult in terms of demography, in terms of politics that are related to that. My question is, based on your work, d does that change the way that you think about uh, responding to climate change in that uh, over the course of time, there is, has been variation in the climate. People have suffered from it, they've adapted to it, but they've had to deal with it. Does that, has that changed your way of thinking about it? Could you hear what he asked? Yeah. 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 I, I wrote these two books, 1491 and 1493, they were about the changes, you know, life before Columbus and changes after it. And this coincided with some, cha some changes in 
the average temperature on the Earth, and there's a period that's been called the medieval warm period, where temperature is quite warm, followed by something called the Little Ice Age, which started in about 1550 and went to about 1800 and caused some very, very severe winters um, in, um, during that time. And so he asked if that affects how I think about, uh, personally think about climate change, and the answer is yes. Um, you know, it gives you a really healthy respect for variability and humans' uh, ability to adapt to it, because we've done it in, in the past. That said, um, I really can't complete the sentence too well about how, you know, how nice it would be without an Antarctic ice sheet. Um, we're talking about a kind of change that happens in a, an extremely rapid um, period that is at least partly under our, our own control. And the effects of it um, could be, um, you know, as with the Little Ice Age, the Little Ice Age um, caused enormous suffering. Here you have all kinds of things that are going on. One of the things that just uh, scared the heck out of me when I learned about it is that rice, which is the most important food in the world, for food crop in the, in, in the world, um, you know, in Asia, its pollen um, will not, it becomes sterile at certain temperatures. And we're, we're quite close to the top range, just by, by chance. And so the people in the International Rice Research Institute in Los Banos in the Philippines, where it was not too long ago, are petrified about the implications of, of, of this. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. That this is what we worry. call burying the lead in the journalism yeah. world. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah the, um, you could argue that this is the, one of the great tragedies of the common that the planet is, is going to experience together. And I guess one of the questions is, you, I'm sure saw Hank Paulson's piece in the uh, New York Times advocating for a carbon tax and for more radical steps to put a price on carbon, be able to capture the externalities that um, that the market does not capture on carbon and put the world in a place where you unleash innovation and, and, and create economic, uh, create a business model that, that drives us towards a lower carbon future. Curious to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I really like bringing over, every economist that I, I think I've ever talked to really likes the idea of a price on carbon and then you let market mechanisms work. Um, but if you look at the, what they talk about, they always, there's always these two words that are in their models, which is full participation. That means everybody has to do it. Not just us, but China, Brazil, India. Everybody has to do it. It has to do it in the same way. Um, the only kind of international agreement like this uh, that, that has ever happened is the Montreal Protocol, um, which was about chlorofluorocarbons, uh, you know, the gases from spray cans that, that go into the air and harm the ozone layer. That's been s successfully amended seven times. It's a wonderful, successful project. But that was about spray cans. This is about the fundamentals of an entire economy. And to, I just can't imagine how that would happen, a full global carbon pricing um, scheme or tar carbon tax, however you, want to, however you want to call it. I mean, it would be great, but how, how? So we have just a couple minutes here. I want to just make one, one factual addition and then, then two mm -hmm. wrap up, a quick wrap up questions for, for Charles. One is talking about putting a price on, on carbon. We've heard from Marvin Odom that Shell has had an internal $30 right. a ton price on carbon emissions for its own workings for quite a long time, which is, which is, 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 is interesting at the least. Um, so one of the wrap-up questions is, knowing as much as you do about the climate science, you follow these debates, how should we think about what is known and what is uncertain at the current state of, of climate science? Because the very issue of knowability and, and what is certain is a huge political issue. Now, what is known and what is not known? Well, it's interesting. Climate, I was, was, Jim and I were talking about this. Climatology is a new science. It sort of springs into existence um, in the late 50s and early 1960s um, from you know, meteorology, which is, very, which is really quite different. Um, it's also an odd science sociologically in that it's mainly conducted in large academic centers, like the, the, there's one here in Colorado for, for, for NOAA. There's not a Harvard Department of Climatology. There's no Yale Department of Climatology. So it's, it's, it has very little, it has weirdly little connection with other disciplines in academia. So consequently, when you look at IPCC reports, what they are are gigantic models of fluid dynamics. Um, they're extraordinary um, reports, but they have very little connection with other, other disciplines. And so if you talk to ecologists, for instance, or soil scientists or marine biologists, they're freaked out because they feel they're, they're, that these are not just about gases. They're about how life and the earth interacts with those gases. And those parts, they, of, uh, you know, they often tell me, are all wrong. For instance, the current IPCC report um, you know, for, for no reason 
believes that the earth was only 5% deforested in, um, in 1500, which is totally wrong. And uh, consequently, when they try to do the estimates for you know, the impact of forestation, they're, they're all wrong. And they're based on surveys from the 1930s of the amount of um, forest growth there was, which are all based um, on stuff in Canada that has nothing to do with like Brazil and so forth. So when you look at these things, there's high degrees of uncertainty. These are simultaneously amazing documents but there's, they're much shakier than the people who make them sometimes say they are. Um, that doesn't mean that the basic idea is wrong, but we really don't have a good handle on the rates. And so this can be a source of comfort. I personally hope it'll be a little slower than they, they, they think, but it also means things can be happening faster. And so we have to deal with the fact that, we're, that we have a general idea of what's, what's, what's going on. The, the other thing that's a big uncertainty is the way clouds behave, and they really, which have an enormous impact on trapping, on trapping radiation. We really don't understand that. My sure. other. The IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was formed by the United Nations uh, back in the 1950s. And every five years or so, they come up with a new assessment of it. And they, and the latest one has said definitely that uh, climate change is real, it's, it's caused by man, and 97.5% of the climate scientists in the world uh, uh, stood by that, that statement. And, uh, and you're and, not disagreeing with no. that? No. Well, they, they, what they don't say is the you rate. It sounded like they, they were making mistakes. There are mistakes in it. You know, well, there are uncertainties in it. 97.5% no, 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 of, you the, could, look, of the climate Look, we're approaching a cliff, but it, we don't know whether we're going 30 miles an hour or 40 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour. The cliff is there. We're approaching it. No, no, I, I, I promise you, if you read the actual IPCC reports, they also will say, you know, there's highly, there's, there's numerous scenarios in which they say, if this is true, we're going to. Yeah. I, yeah. I will assert that, that in the next we have minute we have left, yeah. we'll, you mm. two can discuss this after the yeah, minute right. uh, in, in yeah. this session, and we'll all discuss it for years to come. This, this, so this is the final minute you mm. have. People will remember at most one thing from this session, if we're lucky. What's the one thing you would like them to remember from what you've said? I feel like carbon sequestration is a terrible idea whose time has come. Um, <laughs> It's the worst possible way of dealing with it, but I can't imagine how the world's, the, a future in which in a very short time, the world's 7,000 large coal plants vanish and are replaced by- 30% vanished in the last two, two years. The number of coal plants has increased no, by- yeah, is a, the, I promise you, if you look at the, at the, and you're talking worldwide. I'm talking worldwide. worldwide. They decrease in the U.S. They increase worldwide. And the, and yeah. the increase so, in the worldwide has swamped the decrease in the in, U.S. In my role as referee, I'm going to stand up now. <laughs> so thank you all. Yeah, yeah. We'll have this discussion. Yeah. We'll go on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.